I've been probably evaluating fruit varieties for 50 years or more. I spent 32 years at Rutgers. I have a number of fact sheets that there's probably a lot of good information that are on the Rutgers website that you can get. Uh, I also use some of the data from Clemson. There's a lot of good data on that Clemson, particularly for peaches. And well, there's some there for plums also. And then of course, as Mike said, I'm now working for Adams County Nursery. And my job primarily there is I'm a consultant, but it's to evaluate Adams County has the exclusive right to all of the Rutgers fruit varieties that come out of the breeding program. In addition, they have a license on the USDA varieties. Some of you may know Dr. Ralph Scorza. He was the breeder in Kearneysville for many years. He's retired. I'm not sure if they replaced him or not. But so that's my job now is to look at a lot of those varieties that they've developed and see what the commercial acceptance of them is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of them. I'll probably spend more time on fruit, on peach varieties because I work with them more, but I will talk about others. And we have a catalog. I put some out and some fact sheets out on the desk. Uh, some of the varieties, most of the varieties that I talk about are in the catalog, but some of them aren't. Some of them we don't sell at Adams County. Okay, well, talk, start with some peach varieties. Desiree, some of you may have this planted. This is an early peach. It's been a basically a good cropper. It was interesting listening to the talk this morning on climate change and you know from 1994 until 2014 in New Jersey where I did most of my work we didn't have a cold winter. I mean we were growing just about any variety from anywhere we could grow there as long as it didn't bloom too early. Our winters just were not harsh so Prior to that, from 1983 until 1994, we'd get, you know, we occasionally we'd get 20 below zero. So you got the kind of weather where you could evaluate winter hardiness. Uh, there wasn't the f extreme fluctuations in temperature. Some winters you had them. And nor our normal bloom date for peaches was about mid-April. Now we see you know, I wouldn't be surprised this year if we had a lot of bloom in the end of March. You know, and anything can happen. We don't know what the weather's going to be like. So when you, when you evaluate productivity, it's really become more difficult. It's become more difficult because there's such variation. In 2014, 2015, 2016, and 17, we've had some periods of cold weather where it's gotten cold. What are some of the things we see? I read about, let's say, for example, apricots. I have a, a guy I work with in Idaho, and he tests a lot of apricots there. He gets 20 below zero. If I bring those apricots here, and we have a couple warm days, they lose all their hardiness in the middle of winter. They lose it very quickly. The temperature drops. Not only does it kill the buds, it'll kill the trees. So, you know, you just, it's very difficult when I talk to a lot of growers and they'll tell me, well, I grow this variety and it's not winter hardy. Well, you know, chances are that there's probably been some extreme or some variation in the winter. So I just use the term productivity. If we get to the harvest season, it's productive, even though I look at, I try and look at them after when they just start, the buds just start to break, then I look at them after the fruit is set, and then I look at them when we harvest the fruit to try and record, you know, whether they're productive. But Desiree has, for example, been a reasonably productive variety in the winters that I've evaluated. It's been around for a few years. It's a nice early peach. It does very well. One of the biggest markets for Desiree has been in Ontario. The growers really like it in Ontario comes in before Red Haven. It's a nice early season market. This is a peach that I've been evaluating a long time and I really like it. It's a Clemson peach from the breeding program, Cairo Red. It's just a nice uniform peach, you know, very good color. It hangs on the tree well. It's firm. It does get a little bacterial spot as do a lot of the varieties from the southeast 
in the program. But it's, if you're looking for a peach in Desiree season or kick off your peach season, you ought to look at Cairo Red. It's a nice peach. Now, I don't, eva I don't give a lot of pe early peaches real high ratings on flavor, but this is one that has very nice flavor early in the season. It's, it's Okay, early star, this is a peach from Michigan from the Fruit Acres Breeding Program. Uh, it just sort of jumped out at me. I had it for a long time and I, I was looking at the last three or four years and the winters we've had and it's had a very good crop. It's been nice. Uh, it, it's a nice firm peach. Uh, the, the shape's not as uniform as Cairo Red and Desiree, uh, but I think it's another early peach. It's a little bit after both those two varieties, just a little bit later. Uh, but Cairo Red, because that hangs on the tree so well, will overlap quite a bit with Early Star. Flaming Fury 8 Ball, I, had, I thought I had this peach a long time. Uh, Flaming Fury 8 Ball, but I, the tree I had was the untrue to name, and that happens when you're testing peaches. I think that's any of you that have tested peaches in your orchards, you know, Sometimes you get a tree that isn't true to name and you're evaluating and thinking it's the right variety. And I evaluated this for many years and found out I had the wrong eight ball. My eight ball was ripening much later. But this is a nice peach and it's in century season. If you grow century, maybe on just on the back end of century. Crops, well, I love the size on it. It's got very nice medium large size and colors well. Okay, other early peaches in this season, in demand, Glen Glow in this season of Century 8 Ball is probably the peaches in most demand. More people plant that. It's just a good all-around variety. Uh, it crops fairly well, although I've had some people even in West Virginia where it originated as a mutation that told me they didn't get a crop, but most places. Ruby Prince, I have growers, it's a very nice commercial variety. Ruby Prince, it's a, a, the Prince peaches are from the southeastern part of the United States at the Byron, Georgia station that was introduced a number of years ago and it's, a, it's a widely grown in the southeast. But it's a real nice peach. I've always been concerned about the hardiness but in my test block it's, pretty, it's cropped pretty consistently year in and year out. Uh, so I don't have the problem. There you, uh, some of the growers in the southeast complain that it's split pits a lot. All the peaches in this season get split pits. It's a very hard thing for me to evaluate. I think it's, it's more prone to what the weather is like and how you manage the variety than it is the genetic characteristics of the variety because I've seen split pits on all early peaches. Okay, Gala, peach I've looked at a long time. In New Jersey, Gala is in a very nice season. It's in a season where we need a peach between Glen Glow and Red Haven. It ripens right in that slot. It's a very pretty uniform peach. We have a lot of it planted in southeast, south, southern New Jersey. Uh, it does get some bacterial spot. I have had growers in Pennsylvania, some of them tell me that they've lost crops. I have never experienced that. It's always been uh, fairly productive in, in, in my test block. But as the name would imply, the peach was developed in Georgia and Louisiana, Gala. So it's, it may, I haven't, it doesn't necessarily bloom earlier, but it may, that may be a reason why it's not as winter hardy as some other varieties. This is a nice peach that ripens with Red Haven. Uh, <clears throat> we sell a lot of the, uh, and I wanted, I, before I started showing you varieties, I wanted to mention that my experience is that our peaches taste much better today than they did years ago. We have better peaches in every respect than we used to grow. I keep old varieties in my test block. Uh, Stark Brothers Nursery would always tell me, well, their the number one selling variety was Burbank, July, Alberta. That was one of Luther Burbank's creations. It tastes nice, but it's soft, it doesn't color well, it doesn't handle well, and it drops badly. And I believe me, every peach that I grow beats it on every characteristic. But it's not only that, I've grown, I was raised on a farm where we grew Slappy and Carmen and Albertas and Alberta Queen and Hale Haven and 
our peaches are better. The other thing that we have to realize is that we're doing something wrong in the peach industry because people are eating less peaches. Our per capita peach consumption keeps going down. When I came to New Jersey 32 years ago, the consumers were eating about almost 11 pounds of peaches per person, and it's down below six now. And when you look at surveys, one, you realize that most of the peaches are sold in the supermarket. Uh, they're sold, you know, probably 75 to 85 percent of all the peaches grown are sold in the supermarket. When you look at the surveys in the supermarket, the people say the peach is one of the fruits where they're least happy with what they get. They're inconsistent, and I don't think that's because of the variety exactly, although the variety is certainly a fact. I think it's the way the fruit is handled from the time, when you buy peaches in the supermarket, even the ones that they call tree ripened <laughs> are just graded for color, because I've seen them packed in California. So they're not tree ripened peaches. You know what, you that grow peaches, you know what tree ripened peaches are. Now, in defending tree ripened peaches, the only problem that we have with tree ripened peaches is they're a mess to eat. They're a sloppy mess to eat. And people don't buy peaches if they're going to want to have a fruit drip all over their shirt. They're not standing out in a field like farmers are and eating a peach and letting it drip down. They want to snack peaches. They want to they want to eat peaches just like they do apples. Look at the apple industry, the tremendous increase in consumption there is. So we're looking, we're trying to find peaches that hold up but are still good quality that we can get to the consumer in the supermarket. We're trying to get more shelf space so there are more different kinds of peaches in the supermarket. When you go into the app, any good store, supermarket, you go in right now, there's probably 10 or 14 varieties of apples in the supermarket. You, even in the middle of summertime, when we have peaches out the kazoo, we can't even sell them, there's 10 or 12 varieties of apples taking up shelf space. There's mangoes, there's kiwi fruit, there's a, a mirage of other varieties that we're competing with. So we're, our competition is extreme in the supermarket to sell peaches, which is another reason uh, we probably don't get the per capita consumption. We just don't get the shelf space. So we're trying to sell different things. We're trying to sell white flesh peaches. We're trying to sell low acid peaches. We're trying to sell interspecific hybrids. We're trying to sell donut peaches or flat peaches. That's the only way we can get more shelf space unless the supermarket is satisfied that our yellow flesh peaches are just good. They're good peaches. Of course, I talk to a lot of growers about this and they tell me, it's not that our peaches isn't good, we just don't sell them cheap enough. And price, you know, is a factor. You know, if they can buy peaches that are cheaper, they'll buy them. Anyway, getting off my horse and getting back to the varieties. So this is, this is just the mindset we have in trying to evaluate peaches, even though in Adams County, a lot of our customers are growers and they have their own taste buds and they know what their customers want and they direct market and they're not as excited about having a lot of different novel things to sell. 9A is a nice peach in Red Haven. Why do I like it? Because it's got size. Big fruit. Big fruit in Red Haven season. And, and, and you know, that's most of the varieties that we have uh, don't have the size of 9A. Okay, Evelyn, this is a new variety from our Rutgers breeding program. We just introduced last fall, called of our 357. Difference, subacid. It's a subacid peach. Now, all the other peaches in this season are traditional acidic peaches. Uh, it has about 0.4 average tritratable acidity. So it's, it's, it's a mild peach. It's a mild tasting peach. And I know a lot of growers don't like subacid peaches and they don't, they say their customers don't like them. But, you know, I'll get to that in a minute on another slide. 
Uh, of course, it has great color, good size, very good size, nice firmness. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's got stony hard gene in its parentage, but it's not stony hard. It's, it's just a nice firm peach that hangs on the tree very well. July Prince, this is the biggest peach in South Carolina that they grow. This is a beautiful peach from the breeding program in Byron. It's right in Loring season, contender season, uh, yellow flesh peach, uh, great color. You know, I have growers, the growers really like the variety. Messina is after July Prince. That's one of our Rutgers introductions. It's just a nice traditional flavored peach. The idea was it would be in Crest Haven season to replace Crest Haven, but it's really a little bit earlier. Uh, we introduced another peach in that same season, Gloria. Gloria is a very pretty peach. Uh, Gloria is a very firm flesh peach. It's a very low ethylene producing peach, and it's, so it ripens very slowly. If you plant Gloria and you have a U-pick operation, and they'll see the people see the peaches and they'll want to pick them, but they're not ready, and then they're disappointed. They say it's too hard, it's crunchy, it's too bland. You have to leave it on the tree and let it get keep producing ethylene. If you're going to pick it early, you got to put it somewhere where it's exposed to ethylene. Put it with some other ripe peaches in the storage or in your storeroom if you to let the ethylene help ripen it. It will soften. I've had people say, this peach never gets soft. It does get soft. We can soften it down to about four pounds uh, when, it's, when it's soft, which is still firmer than other peaches, but it's a peach that handles nicely in the supermarket. And if we can pick Gloria and ripen it before we ship it and then pack it and send it to the supermarket, we have a nice peach that we can handle. Uh, and we'll, we'll probably have a, we have a number of varieties like this in our program. Very, very pretty peach. The other thing about Gloria is it blooms late. Very good cropper. It blooms later than any other peach. Uh, and it ripens just, it has a long ripening season, so it overlaps quite a bit with Messina and well into Jersey Queen season, depending on how you handle it. Getting back to subacid peaches, a lot of the peaches that come from California are subacid. They're low acid peaches. Uh, they've done a lot of consumer tasting and preferences, and they found that they, for their industry, they can get peaches to the market, nice peaches that have better flavor, better consumer acceptance if they're subacid. And of course, a lot of the white peaches that we grow, the lady peaches, the Klondike, and they're all subacid peaches. They're they're below 0.5% titratable acidity, and uh, there's probably certain segments in the market that like consumers. There are different ethnic groups that like low subacid peaches. A lot of young consumers like subacid peaches. The other one, the other thing, if they're subacid and firm flesh, they slice nicely. They don't oxidize. They can pack them and use it and put them in snack packs and not, they're, 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 um, oh, I can't think of the word I'm thinking. They're less messy to eat because they don't, the, the juice doesn't splash. When you bite into them, it doesn't spray out all over the place. They're easier to eat, particularly the, you know, the firmer ones, and most of them are pretty firm. 28007, like this peach very much. This is one from Michigan. This peach ripens about redskin season, Jersey Queen season. It hangs on the tree very well. I think some growers pick it too early because it's so red, but it does get bacterial spots. One of the things I don't like it, some of these Flaming Fury peaches are promoted as resistant to bacterial spot, but they, we get such high pressure as Norman has shown in New Jersey that a lot of them will end up, we don't use the term resistance, we use low, medium, or high susceptibility uh, to bacterial spot. Selena is another new variety to replace Jersey Queen, which has been a standard in our industry for many years. Selena is in Jersey Queen season, a nice traditional acidic. It's not a subacid variety. Great size, nice color, low susceptibility to bacterial spot. Historically, we've had a lot of a bacterial spot late on our late varieties. So 
uh, this is a, a step in the right direction. Tiana, which is another one developed in our breeding program, low susceptibility. This ripens just near Encore. Encore was a New Jersey variety. If you've had Encore or Laurel, this variety ripens in that season. How many late peaches should we have? I don't know. Most retailers tell me they can sell, if they have nice peaches, they can sell them well into October. Uh, a lot of apple growers don't want to grow late peaches because they want to grow apples and they can make more money uh, growing apples than they can late peaches. Autumn Star is in sort of in encore season. This is a Michigan variety. This is a variety that I had for many years and I, it was always sort of variable in color and I blamed it on the weather and then I replanted it and got some new trees from another source and they are nice and red. There looks like a different peach. It's not the one I evaluated for years. Again, important to have the right variety when you're evaluating something. Uh, this is from the Fruit Acres program. Uh, we still grow laurel. Oh, I mentioned Autumn Star. Oh, Paul Friday has a number of late peaches uh, at the, from Michigan. Paul's a breeder, if you don't know him. He's a guy you would remember if you ever met him, but he has a lot of late peaches. He's got one uh, we grow in New Jersey. It's called 36007. That ripens uh, just about with Autumn Star. And then he has another one he calls Flaming Fury Pia, Fat Lady. It's supposed to be because it's late, the fat lady sings, whatever that joke is. So he thought it was funny to call it that, but it's actually PF35007. And that one is just a little later. Uh, on, and he's got one called Big George, which is a late peach. I don't have a picture of it. That's a pretty nice peach. That's real late with Victoria. Victoria is uh, our latest peach from the New Jersey program. These are nice samples of Victoria. Victoria. It's, it gets some bacterial spot, but it's a very nice eating peach. It's really a refreshing, nice, sweet peach late in the season. Uh, it also, the color's a little variable. These are a lot redder than some, some years, depending on, on how cool the nights are, uh, because you're picking a peach on the 15th or 20th of September. Uh, it won't be as highly colored. But it hangs very, it, it hangs, but it's nice and firm. It has a nice, firm texture to it. Okay, white peaches. This is a peach we introduced about six or eight years ago called Scarlet Rose. Scarlet Rose is a very firm peach. Uh, our breeders use that term stony hard. It's like an apple. It's very crunchy. Uh, white flesh, it's cling stone. Gorgeous peach. It blooms late. Does get a little bacterial spot. Uh, and it's generally been consistent year in and year out. Uh, the problem with this peach is the flesh never softens. It just stays, it's, I assume it's another low ethylene producing peach. It just never softens up. But uh, Mike, make sure you tell me when I have five minutes. <laughs> it, never, it never softens up. And it's, but it's got nice sweet flavor. It's a, it's a sub-acid peach in the season. Oh, the point I was making, the flesh soft, doesn't soften, but the skin gets soft. And so, you know, you think the peach is hard, and then the skin starts to get, it gets what I call snaky skin on it. It's, it's rough like a snake on the outside of it. And then this, that discolors. You start to handle it, you get a rain, and it discolors on the fruit. So, I don't know what, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful peach and it tastes good, but it's, a, it's tough to handle. July Rose is a, is a peach we introduced last fall, or two falls ago from Adams County at Rutgers Tree Fruit Breeding Program. A nice sub-acid peaches. <clears throat> a lot of the California varieties that we're growing get a lot of bacterial spots. Some of them crop in consistently, at least the ones I evaluated prior to 1994. Uh, white Lady, for example, when I evaluated White Lady, it was a numbered selection, and then it was introduced, it was from Zyger Genetics, but it was different. It was gorgeous peach, 
beautiful, but it was sub-acid, it was very, very firm, got some bacterial spot, not too bad. Uh, but these varieties, we're, we're trying to introduce varieties that don't get bacterial spot, high bricks, more tree friendly, and if we have a problem with productivity, uh, Klondike, for example, is one that's gorgeous, a gorgeous peach, but it's a very poor producer uh, in New Jersey. So this is a subacid peach, which has low susceptibility to bacterial spot. Great size, great color, nice tasting peach. Uh, did I miss a slide here? No, I guess I didn't. Benedicti is a French variety. I've had it for a long time. It's a subacid peach. It's it ripens in, uh, you know, between sugar giant and snow giant uh, with Lady Nancy. Lady Nancy, I put on there. Lady Nancy is an old peach. It was a mutation of Jersey Queen, but it's always been one of my standards of quality. It's got terrific flavor. It's a traditional flavored peach. It's got that old time aromatic f smell to it, very fragrant. And it's easy to identify because when you cut it, it's got a little yellow line right along the suture. Uh, it's identifying characteristic. We still sell it, but it's really a nice peach for local sales. And, uh, you know, depending on where your orchard is situated, uh, you could probably grow it. It's just like Jersey Queen. Okay, at the breeding program in Arkansas, Dr. John Clark has a number of interesting varieties. He's got a series of white varieties, and I've tried to evaluate them over the years. Uh, unfortunately, I keep losing trees because I get them from southern nurseries and they don't grow well, so I haven't gotten as good an evaluation as I'd like to. This is one I've had a long time, though. This is White Cloud. It's probably the best one he has. It's right in Red Haven season, which is right with <laughs> White Lady, but it's, it's got a nice, firm, sort of a non-melting flesh. Uh, it's between what I would call stony hard and non-melting. If, if you've ever eaten like a cling, uh, a, a canning clingstone peach from California with that rubbery texture, this is sort of in between there. John has a lot of, has uh, different varieties, White Diamond, White Rock, White County. And they all have different flesh textures to them. They're, they're very interesting. But they all have good flavor. And they handle well. This one's got nice size. I never got enough of a crop on the others to evaluate the size. But we, I have them replanted at our Adams County Test Orchard to look at them. August Rose we introduced. August Rose is a late peach. This is in sugar giant season to compete with sugar giant, a nice big peach. Good color, it's a sub-acid peach again. Doesn't get the bacterial spot that Sugar Giant does. Sugar Giant gets a lot of inking. We have a lot of problems handling it in packing houses because when you run it over the grater, it gets skin discoloration, which we get on some of the other dark peaches. I haven't seen it on August Rose. Okay, nectarines. This is one that I have fruited a few years. This is from the Kernigsville Breeding Program, Nectifest. It ripens early in the season near Eastern Glow, if any of you have ever grown Eastern Glow, or, uh, well, there's some Harrow nectarines in that season. There's a bunch of stuff from California that gets so much bacterial spot. Nice clean fruit, good size, but great flavor. Uh, very good set flavor. Early in the season, it's a tradi It's also a, a, unlike some of the other nectarines. It's early ones. It's got traditional nectarine flavor, not real tangy, but just nice and sweet. Uh, it, but it's a nice nectarine. Avalon is one we introduced in New Jersey a couple years ago. Early yellow nectarine, 12 days. It's about the same season as Nectifest. Uh, <clears throat> this one, unlike Nectifest, is subacid. Very good flavor, nice flavor. I think from what I've seen, I think Nectifest may have a little better size than this one, but it's got really, it really has a nice quality. It's been very productive. Maybe it's just, be, just because it hasn't had as many fruit on the tree. Brigantine we just introduced last fall. Brigantine is between Avalon and Summer Butte. 
Uh, it's in sort of in the gala peach season. It's a nice season for us where we need a nectarine. Semi freestone firm. Uh, um, it's, it's basically been a clean. One thing that we always have a problem with some years is our nectarines, they get slopped up, they get marks on them and blemishes, so I try and evaluate this. And I've been impressed how clean this one is. It, it does get some bacterial spot, but not bad. Uh, and, we, and, and the same with Avalon. They're both, I would rate, low susceptibility. Uh, but this one has nice size. I like the size on this one. This is much bigger than Avalon and Eastern Glow. It's on the order, well, I think it's probably big. I don't have Summer Butte right next to it. I've got some Fire Bright there, and it's got nice size. <coughs> okay, PF11, this is one of Paul Friday's nectarines. I've had this many years. This is a nice big nectarine. It's surprisingly, uh, I don't know where Paul got it from or how he got it, uh, but it's a nice nectarine. We have growers that grow it commercially. I originally thought it was too soft, but uh, it's just, you know, it does get a little bacterial spot in New Jersey, so we, I rate it moderate susceptibility. But a good flavor, traditional flavor, you know, not subacid. Silver Gem, this is an early white nectarine, uh, ripening about 13 days before Red Haven. Uh, it's, a, it's a really nice quality nectarine, not a big, large nectarine, but there's no problem getting two and a half inches. Uh, low susceptibility to bacterial spot, really has nice flavor though. It's a subacid nectarine. And then Silver Glow is a little later. This is a big nectarine, uh, ripening just before Red Haven. It overlaps well with Red Haven. Uh, low susceptibility to bacterial spot, but the the appearance, the cleanness, the uniformity of the fruit are all very nice on Silver Glow, which was just introduced last fall. We grow this in New Jersey. It's a late peach from France, or nectarine from France called Zephyr. It's, it's, a, it's again, it's a traditional sweet nectarine, very nice quality, very, very nice tasting nectarine, very good flavor with traditional acidity. And then one flat peach I put in here. Uh, we have a lot, we have quite a few more of these in our breeding program. We don't know, well, there's only one grower that really grows a lot of them. Most growers grow a few, and that's because that's all they can handle. They're hard to handle. You, you know, they don't go through your packing line very well. But this is a nice firm one. This one is very firm, uh, no skin tearing. It's got a clean bottom on, it's got nice color and good flavor, very good flavor. It's not a don what I classify as a donut peach because it's clingstone uh, and stone doesn't pop out. But it's, it's the trademark is Buenos. We're not sure, the only thing you have to do, you have to make sure it's one of the few peaches or nectarines that you plant on a block where there's other peaches and nectarines because it's pollen sterile. So. Uh, but it's always set on my test block, it always sets up fruit. Of course, I have lots of other varieties. <clears throat> I stuck this one in. This is a, a nectarine that we're introducing. We haven't named it yet because it's still going through the interregional repository out in Washington. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a flat nectarine, superb quality, very early, very early season. It does get a lot of cracks on the scar end. That's the only thing. I don't like about it, and it also gets some bacterial spot. So, but there's growers that want it, you know, we've put out a lot of test plantings. Okay, pears. Uh, these pears are, these two varieties are from the USDA Sunrise, which is an early, these are both fire blight resistant. Uh, Sunrise is an early season one that's resistant to fire blight. Shenandoah is a late season after Bartlett, three weeks after Bartlett. We also have another one that's very nice, good quality, blight resistance called GEM from the USDA program. GEM uh, probably ripens about three to four weeks after, after just a little after Shenandoah. Uh, GEM has really nice quality. They all have nice quality to me. I think they all have very good uh, 
good quality. Uh, I can't say the demand for eastern pears is real strong. Uh, everybody will grow something if it's nice, but I don't know where the industry's gone. Oh, hey, this is another one. We have a number of varieties from Harrow. Uh, the Harrow program has been discontinued for all uh, fruits as far as I know. That's what I'm told. Uh, so this is one of the last things introduced from there. So it's three weeks after Bartlett. And I shouldn't say that because there's a lot of test selections we have to, that have to be evaluated, but I don't think they're making any crosses. Uh, but again, a fire blight resistant pear. This one has nice size. Cold snap is, is a nice size pear, but they have, all have that nice fine texture, that buttery texture. Uh, there's probably, we need to learn more about, you know, how they store and handle. Uh, but I think if you're gonna sell them locally, that shouldn't be a problem. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about apples. Demand trends on apples. We put our heads together at Adams County. These are the apples that the people we sell trees to demand. Premier Honeycrisp, which is an early maturing Honeycrisp, Aztec Fuji, Red Honeycrisp. Everybody wants to grow Honeycrisp. Unfortunately, a lot of places they grow it. Doesn't get very red, doesn't get very good. Buckeye Gala is our number one Gala, but there are others. Crimson Crisp is a very uh, hot apple for us. Since the patent on ambrosia has expired, everybody wants to plant ambrosia. Daybreak Fuji, we sell a lot of. Barnsby Pink Lady, and then we grow controlled or club varieties for growers if they control the variety, you know, and we can, we can we'll grow those under contract. Wildfire Gala, a couple new things. This is a, I think this came from New Zealand that matures earlier than Royal Gala, it seems to have nice red color. I've just seen fruit of it. <clears throat> Ripens earlier, th three weeks earlier than Gala, so it's a, you know, peach season apple. Uh, uh, and it's, the ones I've eaten taste, just taste like Gala. I'm questioning, you know, how, how the weather will affect it, although Gala's a, an apple that historically has been grown in hot weather how it will stand up in the heat, but we'll see. Premier Honeycrisp, I picked these. The box on the right is uh, Premier Honeycrisp. I think this was about August the 10th or 12th. I picked these and the left are regular Honeycrisp. So this, uh, this is just, it's just like Honeycrisp except it ripens two to three weeks earlier. Uh, we haven't seen as many problems with post-harvest disorders in Bitter Pit and Premier as we see on regular Honeycrisp, but I'm not, I'm, I guess, I don't know if that's a valid claim we can make. Then we have, we sell two strains of Honeycrisp. We sell Minnesota B42, which was tested by Jim Shoup at Penn State uh, and the people at Michigan, where it was select, or Michigan, Minnesota, where it was selected and it's the reddest consistently reddest one. We sell Firestorm, which is, I think comes from Willow Drive Nursery. I can't remember what orchard it comes from. And I'm not sure we're Royal Red, that we don't sell that, but that's one I've seen in catalogs and supposedly it's popular. Supposed to be the same as a Honeycrisp, but redder. Trying to get red Honeycrisp. If you walk into a lot of your supermarkets today and look at Honeycrisp, they look like the border of the slide there. A lot of them are pretty green. I don't know how many of you buy them. They're still $3.99 a pound in our supermarkets, uh, which is about a dollar, at least a dollar a pound higher than anything else. Autumn Crisp, a New York apple. Long time to get it on the market. Ripens in South Central Pennsylvania in mid-September. Uh, just a nice crisp apple in that season. I'm not sure where this is going to go, but we mark it as something relatively new. This is a smoothie, selection of smoothie or Gibson cultivar from Italy that we are propagating. We have trees for sale. Uh, it's smoother than other Golden Delicious. And in its point of origin and in our test orchard, it gets a red blush on it. It gets a little red blush on it. That may be a detriment uh, to growing Golden Delicious. 
Quirina, Quirina was developed by, in France, I saw that on somebody's slide earlier. Uh, Quirina, I like this apple. I grow it in pots in my backyard because it's scab immune, uh, it, it, but it, and it doesn't get mildew according to the instructions and it's supposedly somewhat tolerant to fire blade. I haven't seen any of those diseases. I know it gets cedar apple rust because I have a lot of cedar trees around my plot, so I get plenty of cedar apple rust on it. It's a really nice tasting apple and it stores and handles well. Pretty apple in South Jersey, nice color. Uh, again, with a name like that, we'll have to see where it goes. Uh, Crimson Crisp, this is an apple, scab immune apple that came from our breeding program at Illinois, Purdue and Rutgers. Nice mid seat, uh, you know, Apple in uh, mid-season, I'm not, it ripens over an, an, a fairly wide period of time in our test storage at Adams County, although we have a lot of planted in the commercial orchard. Really nice texture, nice eating apple, very pretty apple, good size. Crips Pink, we sell the original Crips Pink, Pink Lady, and then Barnsby Cultivar is an early coloring, early maturing Pink Lady about two weeks earlier than the original. And Maslin is one you'll see on the market, but it's not stable in our test box, so we don't sell that at Adams County, but it is sold by some other nurseries. Hopefully, you, if you buy it, make sure you get a stable selection that doesn't revert back to standard Pink Lady. Evercrisp, great apple. I love Evercrisp, one of the best tasting apples. Not necessarily a real beautiful apple, it's more like a standard or some of the initial red Fuji's, uh, sort of a, a washed out color, but it, boy, it has great flavor and stores well. This was developed at the Midwestern Apple Improvement Association, and they've introduced a whole bunch of other apples. I've tasted them all. I don't think any of them taste as good as Evercrisp, but they're all good tasting apples. I don't know how well they've been tested. We don't sell any of them at this particular time, but I know some of the nurseries are selling them that have the rights to sell uh, apples from the Midwest. Uh, Mike mentioned Gold Rush, one of my favorites, although you can screw up Gold Rush if you, don't, if you pick it too early. Uh, it's a very late apple. Uh, I mean, we picked Gold Rush in mid-November in South Jersey. Uh, it, it's a very late apple, but it's really a nice tasting apple. These are some grown in Pennsylvania in our test orchard. It's a fairly easy tree to grow, I think, uh, and it's got, you know, scab immunity, resistance to mildew. It is susceptible to cedar apple rust, but doesn't get much fire blight. I guess the biggest disadvantage of gold rush for a commercial grower is the finish. It can get a rough finish on it. Uh, these are fairly nice, but I have seen it. Okay, apricots, I'll fin finish up here. I, we have an apricot breeding program in New Jersey. We've had one for 100 years. I can't, these are some that were varieties that were introduced. I helped introduce this cold of our early blush. Nice tasting apricot, but it doesn't bloom any later than any other apricot. So if you wanna grow apricots, I would suggest you try early blush. You can't go wrong on the flavor. Size is medium. Uh, uh, it's an, it's an, it ripens in early mid-season in terms of apricots. Sugar pearls, definitely everybody should have a sugar pearls tree if they grow apricots because it tastes so good. This is just, the, the flavor on this is unbelievable. It's soft but juicy. Most of the fruit has over 20% soluble solids concentration, but it gets a nice, it gets a sort of a speckled rip red over a washed out yellow under color. Uh, uh, it's south fruitful, it's always set fruit, but I'm reading some of the work that's done on it. They say it in crops improved with having, it blooms a little later than some of the, when I say late blooming, that means late blooming for apricots. Doesn't mean late blooming related to other fruit. Alona was a variety we introduced in 1915. Uh, an early, another very early season, apricot, excellent flavor, nice mild sweet flavor, never seen much bacterial spot on it. Robata, 
We don't sell this one, but we have growers that grow this, and it's in our test block. This is really a nice apricot. It's a California variety, south fruitful, nice fruit size, attractive, uh, and it, it's firmer and seems to handle better. It's not as soft as some of the other cots. Uh, I put a slide of Ruby Queen in. I've done a lot of evaluating of plums over the years, uh, probably fruitlessly. Uh, this is only the only one we ever introduced that I evaluated was Ruby Queen. Uh, most of the plums that I evaluated came from the breeding program at Byron, and they were, had native plum in their parentage, Prunus angustifolium, and they were crossed with Oriental plums and American plums, and there was a ton of them, some nice varieties, but when Dr. Uki retired, uh, nobody was there, so I just bulldozed them all out. So I have pretty much given up other than what we have. We have a, in our Adams County test orchard, we have a lot of test varieties. We have, this is a plum cot. Anyway, I like Ruby Queen. I like this plum cot. This is a southern plum cot, but it blooms early. It's an early bloomer, but it seems to set up well and set up through the bloom. It's a nice, pretty fruit. I don't think it's as tasty as growing some of those early apricots or early peaches, but it's, it's very attractive. Uh, and then I got one more here. Spicy, we have a lot of these interspecific hybrids in our Adams County Test Orchard. This is a nectar plum, which is basically, it's really a nice tasting fruit. It's been fairly productive there. It's, it's, you, it always stands out because it has red leaves and the red leaves turn sort of pinkish and the fruit as it ripens gets sort of pinkish. But it's really a nice tasting, a nice spicy, sweet flavor in, in uh, mid-August. So I think I'm just about done. I don't want to take up any more time. I'm, I'm out of time, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah.